want to point out that I am the one who discovered Chris Dyer. Diamond in the Rough. I love Chris's art because it's wild, it's imaginative, and it taps into all these dimensions of soul and spirit. So much patterns and so much to look at, you can really get lost in one of those paintings. I saw these broken skateboards that were painted, super funky realism, and they weren't priced right for how good the art was. There's all this energy in his paintings, and there's also the bigger energy of everything, which is spirituality and connectedness and his beliefs. Beyond optimism, he's a very positive person. He also has insecurities, like every human being, but he'll try to overcome it and do something about it. He just sees his life as something to be shared with people. you got to love him for it. I think artists are like superheroes with special powers. So we have to have responsibility and use those superpowers in the benefit of all humanity and not just our own egos. We're either going to wake up or burn down to the ground. So I think artists have to do their part in making meaningful art, art that has a message, art that's doing something to collaborate with our awakening. The general theme of my art would be spiritual evolution and unity. In the end, I'm just trying to say that even though we're all totally different, we're still cells of the same body. We're still all one. I think it's uh, important for us to visualize our higher selves so that we don't stay at the level of animals, but at the level of gods, who we are inside. Life is your creation, you can create anything you want. I guess we'll start with the beginning. Though I was conceived in Lima, Peru, my parents decided to move to Ottawa, Canada for me to be born. Off we went to Canada and in Toronto I was stopped and taken in by two police women into a little room to check what I had under my skirt, so I had to lift, lift my dress up and show them that what I had was a pregnant stomach instead of a bag of drugs. I came out into the world in Ottawa and then we moved to Toronto and lived there for a couple years and then by age four we returned to Peru. I was still just learning what the world was about and suddenly I'm in a new place with new climate, with new kind of people, new culture. It's just totally weird for a little kid. My mom was an English teacher. My dad was a sort of businessman and a dirt bike racer. a little bit different from the rest of the kids who were always playing soccer. I was more into drawing on the side of the soccer field or being creative. When we were kids, Chris used to always find some kind of creative way to have fun. When we go to surf shops where they make the surfboards, he would grab the, the leftover pieces and, and shape the little tiny boards out of the leftovers. 
Aside from the typical toys that you could buy, these very expensive toys, he also made many things with his own hands. He was pretty creative, so I'm very proud of that. So I went to a private school. It was called Markham College. It was British, one of the best of South America. It was a little bit difficult for me because I'm such a free soul, yet the school was very strict. All the teachers were really harsh on the kids if they didn't abide all the rules. Siempre era raro. Recuerdo en las clases, ¿no? Siempre es una de estas personas que nunca sabe en qué momento callarse. Siempre terminaba fuera de la clase. Afuera, Christopher. I was a pretty confused kid because my parents kept on moving me from one country to the next and I guess that creates some kind of confusion and frustration. But at the same time, I think you come into this planet with a little bit of a blueprint. And I'm of the belief that in my past lifetime, I don't know what happened, but something went wrong. And when I got back here to planet Earth, I was pissed off about it. I was just angry as a kid. I was like, fuck. He used to throw his lunchbox from the second floor, like smash it to the ground. And that was kind of the personality of Chris, you know, very, very extreme, very angry. Yeah, it was just the way I was, but that's fine. I find uh, trouble kids sometimes are the ones who end up being the, the best because they, they end up following their hearts, which is the most important thing to do. I was never really too good at team sports or soccer, so I was more of the kind of kid who would do an individual expression like skateboarding. Peru was under a really bad government, so it was like imports were very difficult, so it was a lack of skateboarding equipment. So we grew up in a world where we made everything. Like if you wanted low cut skateboarding shoes, you had to buy some crappy shoes at the store and patch them together and and put, you know, with shoe goo, make like all the pads and stuff that are now all built into a pair of shoes. So it was like just do-it-yourself creative culture. And that's how we started skateboarding, with all these crappy skateboards, making little ramps with whatever wood we can find because it was always expensive for us. It was so do-it-yourself that more artists were involved in it. And it, it led beyond skateboarding into everything. Why shouldn't we make our own art? Why shouldn't we make our own music? Why shouldn't we make our own, our own planet? Later on, when I was in my teens, I started surfing. I had different friends who I'd surf with, from my school friends, and then I started hanging out with this nice crew called the Team Videos, and we are, uh, had lots of nice adventures together. I also drew a very big book of cartoons based on the team videos. He always found a way to document his life. He would always do cartoons or caricatures of himself and his friends. That influenced me a lot uh, growing up because uh, I started to imitate what he did and that's what got me into art. In 1994, all my friends started going to the soccer stadium to cheer for the team. My grandfather was the founder of Universitario de Deportes, also known as LAU, the U. 
we had our little crew or our gang called Tortura at the beginning, meaning torture, and El Obituario Norte was the second one. All the little groups got together and formed a mega group called Sepulcro. Obviamente íbamos a la, la zona popular porque era, digamos, lo, lo atrevido. ¿no? Christopher no sabía ni quién estaba jugando el partido. Él nunca fue hincha del equipo, creo yo. Él más que nada era hincha de, de la trinchera norte. ¿no? Era un sitio donde podías ir a gritar y expresarte y, y botar un montón de, de cosas que, que tienes adentro. For me, the soccer stadium environment and the street gang world was my opportunity to release that destructive force that's in me. When you go to a soccer stadium, you're cheering with thousands of people with the same purpose, and you get lost in it. When everybody is focusing their energy at the same time for the same reason, and suddenly you make a goal, and it's like the most extreme explosion of energy. But at the same time, when you lose, there's so much anger and destructive energy put together in these thousands of people that you go out and you destroy everything in your path. But it's understandable in a poor country where you're so poor and you got nothing to do with your life. Passion for a soccer team can just fill it up with something. They like to go to the stadium to see a Universitario, to demonstrate a lot of love to Universitario. But you have to change because the street changes you. In Peru, people like to fight. That's the reason that you're going to the stadium, and that's the reason that you are from Norte. It was a very exciting part of going to a soccer game and seeing how much people cared about their teams to the point where it wouldn't make sense and they'd start hurting each other. So there's all these little artistic things that the gang does and I was into all that stuff. I'd like to go out there and do spray painting around town even though it's highly illegal. You know, ruin everybody's houses just to get the name of my gang out. And if you want to be a better street gang, after the soccer matches, you go out and fight with the gangs that support the other soccer team. So these fights were called guerreros. The people in the neighborhood hated us so much that they would throw bricks from their roofs to try to get rid of us, but then those bricks would break into little rocks and we would keep on throwing at each other. And of course, everything in its path gets destroyed. To fight like that, Guerrero is a dance. You have to, to fight with your, with your knife like this, you know? You are, you are painting because suppose that's what you're going to do in their body. Really, really like a prehistorical uh, situation. Once I saw this guy from the enemy street gang came into our turf and he was messing with our side and he got beat up till he was a bloody pulp and he died right there. Seeing that extreme of so-called evil sort of teaches you that that's not really what you want to represent, that's not really what you want to do with your life. At age 17, I had my second culture shock. My parents had told me for years that when I finished school, they were going to send me to university in Ottawa, Canada. I had to leave my family, Sepulcro. I had to leave my school friends, and I had to leave Team Video Surf Team, which threw a pretty wild party for me that final day. Ottawa 
was pretty difficult for me because I had to move in with my 75 year old grandmother who'd been living by herself for 20 years. Well, he had a lot to learn. I had to teach him. Everything was so strange for him. We felt so sorry for him. We didn't know any other kids his age. Poor thing. He was painting all day and trying to fill his time. I was stuck in my room watching TV, but I also got quite creative. I wrote a 65-page book about my street gang experiences. His art is not my cup of tea, but he worked very hard at it, and he was very meticulous, and he did very well once he started at Heritage College and got into his classes, and at the end of his studies, at Heritage, he got a scholarship to Ottawa U. Eventually I went to college and I met some friends. I was really happy. They were called the HOH, also known as the Hoods of Heritage, and they accepted me as their Rookie of the Year. The HOH was just a young group of men small rural town, curbs, skateboards, Theodore's, two a night, ting ting, it was going to be a good time with one joint each man. At first Hoods of Heritage was pretty discreet light firecrackers or throw a smoke bomb in a class or drink 40s just to be stupid. We met Chris, he came into the fold and then this guy just fueled our energy. First time I brought Chris Dyer out. At one point he's sitting like an Indian Right on the top of the bar, where the bartender is serving drinks, he starts smashing glasses off the racks. Pish, pish, pish. And he's screaming in Spanish, biggity bop bop, smackity smack smack. When we first partied, there was a new character that came up. It was the Al Flyer, trying to fight massive men who we knew from high school would absolutely rip his head off. So we'd have to beat him up ourselves and run him out of the bar before some massive football guy was going to kick his face in. Despite everything, the lack of language, the barfing, the blood, the questions, I knew there was more to Chris Dyer. I was hooked on Chris. always following everyone around with a video camera documenting everything we did putting it together in little like short films and then he would make cartoons about the adventures we had he made everything we did seem like bigger and better because he was always around sort of with his artistic viewpoint that's the thing about the camera Chris always had this camera and it just fueled the HOH that camera got going and we just did shit that you would never really do we never hurt anybody, robbed anybody, stole anything. We just smash it and drank. So also in these uh, Ottawa college days, it's when I went back to skateboarding seriously with my friends of the HOH and we called ourselves the Team Hortons. I was just so inspired by the skating, I was like, okay, I gotta make skate videos. So for three or four years, I started filming and editing in a very ghetto fashion. Skater Bell was about our reality together as the HOH. Ah, come on! There you go. Ah, ah. 
Simon's broken hip was pretty gruesome. So I got a lot of air time on my VCR. Simon hurt. Ah! My right leg makes pain. You okay? Ah, my leg hurts. My leg hurts. Which, which leg? I'd watch him try to mix things. It was like two VCRs and scramble this, scramble that. You know, Jesus. The amount of hours that he put in alone just make those videos fucking beautiful. In the year 2000, I started a new chapter in my life. I uh, moved to the beautiful, artsy French island of Montreal and I went to college for three more years studying illustration and design. Official Montreal resident, impressive, no longer regressed in the city of sex and domestic, homegrown, we culture, artisan type. When it's spring, summer, fall, that's Montreal. Yeah, that's Montreal. Montreal is special for one because we have the mountain. The true spirit and energy comes from the mountain. Also, the festivals here are endless. The only time here that's, that's rough is the winter time. But if you can survive a winter in Montreal, he can survive anywhere in the world. I moved in with Chris in Montreal with me, Chris, and our, another friend of ours, Kent, living together in a tiny, tiny apartment. And we had a big wall of 40 ounce bottles of beer that we were very proud of. Mayhem ensued for sure. If I thought I'd been a big drunk in my Ottawa days, it was only training for my first year of college in Montreal. Alcohol was super cheap and accessible there, and I was drunk five times a week. We had this great bar we found, couldn't believe it. It was like, wow, this, this is a great place, and we started going there all the time. Sure enough, before long, Chris scared the owner. The bad thing about getting kicked out of a place is that Chris would then end up in the street, which is worse, because that's where the cops are, and that's where he can get into some real trouble. These nights would end up with people in the hospital, just for no good reason, just kids being stupid. That's who we were. Once Chris gets going, you can't rein him in. I did lots of destructive things, I hurt many people, I hit on too many girls, and I was just totally destroyful of my own self and others. If destroyful is even a word. I had a pretty good school experiences in those three years. I learned a lot. And even though I was drunk a lot in my first year, I still did all my work and uh, teachers seemed to be quite happy with what I was doing. First day of class was pretty much a time when we ended up bugging heads and bugging ideas. He didn't want to listen to me and he really saw me as the establishment. I took it as a personal challenge. I saw the aspects of him that can actually end up helping people through his work as an artist. It was just this big ball of energy basically that needed some kind of direction and nurturing. If it was a struggle for him, he really didn't show it. He, he had such a positive attitude that he was able to work within the restrictions of that program but somehow be himself, which is quite a juggling act in a three-year career program. Every year, the graduating students of illustration and design have put together an exhibition. We tend to approach it in a rather formal way with very carefully hung displays. Chris didn't really want to do it that formally, but he also wanted to hang it crooked 
I do remember staring at this display and wondering, hmm, is that really such a good idea, Chris? We just said, let the man do as he sees fit. And so that's in fact what he did. His basis, his foundation was deeper spirituality, something which at that point in my life when I met Chris, I was going through this transformation myself. Seeing a young man such as Chris being able to do it uh, inspired me to actually go forward and, and take that step. Chris allowed me to see that I really didn't need to have an obligation. The whole process of questioning, I quit my job, <laughs> I quit everything that I was before to have to become the artist that I am today. That is partly due to his inspiration. Another thing I learned from Chris is not to take it so seriously and have fun whenever you can. The lessons were being exchanged. We were definitely a teacher-student relationship and, and Chris ended up being my teacher and I ended up being his student. I see him as a pioneer. So I was pretty uh, sick of my self-destructive path I've taken the last few years. So I decided to go on by myself and I worked as a tree planner for two months in summer. It allowed me to be deeply into nature. From your eyes I can hear you. From your mind I can see you. This time we will rise up with spirit. It's pretty mesmerizing, like being in the middle of nowhere in Canada, so beautiful and vast, and like you forget how deep in the woods you are but then you realize you're like, wow, I'm in the middle of this amazing planet, and it's very spiritual. You get this, Carlos? Yeah. Right on. It's beautiful. And because no one knew me, it was a chance to reinvent myself. I even didn't even want to be Chris anymore. I changed my name to Carlos. I knew him as Carlos. Carlos Sanchez. Carlos Sanchez. And I had a chance to just be the person who I felt like being in that moment and have, have no baggage with it, you know? I'm looking high. In Canada, there's actually one of the biggest forests of the world. I mean, Canada is such a big country, but it's just a, a wasteland of like the first half of all forest. So obviously logging is a huge, huge industry in Canada. But with all that logging, all of it gets replanted every year in humongous numbers. I and mean, if we have one of the biggest logging industries of the world, we certainly have the biggest reforestation industry in the world. I often compare it to like the Canadian Army. You, know, you go on the Greyhound bus to these northern towns, to the frontier towns where you take bush roads to get to wherever you're going, or helicopters or boats. You end up in these big camps, often like 50, 60 people, and everyone sleeps in tents. There's a gigantic mess tent where they make the food. So every morning you wake up around 6 in the morning, you go out there, there's a big breakfast waiting, everyone has breakfast, you pack your lunch, and then they drive you off early in the morning to the block, which is the clear cut where you're reforesting. Good morning, tree planners! Open up your ears, pay attention, one second, something real important here. Get the fuck up! <laughs> Don't get stuck inside your mind when you're planting. Your feet shuffling around like you're dancing. You're carrying so many pounds, you'd be panting. That's what happens to your body when you're cheap planting. Well, if you can find the time to think clearly about where you really are and where to put your next tree, relying on fate may be your only mistake. But don't be late, cause the checks won't wait. So I say, my oh my, have I seen very many dead end jobs before? And but these here trees resonate positivity up for me a whole lot more than well, You can choose a better job in any downtown that you have found But if not, shut your mouth and put a tree in the ground <laughs> And people plant, you know, up to 3,000 trees per person every single day So it's like a camp as a whole, you're often planting 100,000 trees per day so it's a very like industrial industry and everyone's working so hard. And there's a lot of competitiveness and like macho-ness, like who can plant the most, who can work the hardest, you know? Oh, 
wherever you are, don't go to be planting. <laughs> <laughs> Planting's a weird job because you're doing stuff that no one would like to do. Working in muddy clear cuts, you're on the sun, there's no shade all day. You have to carry kilos of trees. It's a really bad breaking job. The mud gets up your nose and your nails and you're dirty for many days in a row. Your body is hurting, you're working under the rain. There's even an expression called bugging out, which is when someone loses their sanity because they can't take the bugs. They start swinging their shovel, jumping, rubbing, rubbing their face in mud, just doing anything to get out of it. And at the end of the day, man, you're cut, you're bleeding because everything, you know, get whipped by trees. Like you saw a bear come really close to you, a bear charge you, you thought you were going to get killed there. But the bottom line of our stinking job is this. You pay me half a cent a lesson, I would probably quit. Oh, but for now. On the other side, uh, life as a planter is really good. You don't have to cook and you get fed a lot of good food and you meet very interesting people from all over the country, which is like second family for the time you're there. You have wild parties that I don't think can be described here. Under debauchery, I mean, parties will turn into everyone running around naked. There's all these weird competitions that people create because they're all macho and, and totally drunk. The day is so rough that you just gotta party so hard to make up for it and to actually enjoy the job. It makes this whole culture of people who just work super hard for a few months of the year and then finish the season, you know, in July and have 10 grand in their bank account to go traveling. So they go around the world and do whole, all sorts of things. That, next year when meets back up in the bush. So it's a really like interesting phenomenon subculture in society. I honestly don't think I would have stayed tree planting if it wasn't for Chris. It's really inspiring to see him create all the time. Whenever we were waiting, he had his book in hand and he would be drawing his uh, beautiful creations. I've got one seed to throw in the garden So there's many good and bad things about tree planting. Living in nature is just fantastic, you know? It gives you time to think and to reconsider what life's about. It taught me a kind of spirituality that has no words. It's about a simplicity of existence. It's about being in harmony with everybody around you and acceptance of yourself and others. Nature pretty much taught me the basics from scratch and I was able to find my soul. This whole tree planting chapter really changed me and set up the following paths of my life, like becoming an activist, like becoming a traveler, and uh, just a general spiritual, well-intended person. That whole tree planting experience I had definitely opened up my mind to the possibilities of being a free person and loose footed. But right after tree planting, I got on the road and started hitchhiking. Oh look, it's a hobo. We're going to the road now. We are presently in Revelstoke, BC. One of the advantages of being a hobo hitchhiker is that you can just go to sleep wherever you want on the road. So we squatted here in the middle of some bush, but we're getting up this morning, ready to go for the next adventure. God took care of me. I crossed Canada in five days. I only spent 
20 bucks because LA was so nice. They always gave me rides, they fed me, they gave me a place to sleep, and I met the most interesting people that I would have never met anywhere else. It really taught me a lot about the possibilities of what can happen when you just sort of like spread your wings. That hitchhiking trip across Canada inspired me so much, I then repeated the experiment by crossing Mexico. Well, we actually got on a Greyhound bus to Texas, walked across the line into Mexico, started hitchhiking down the country. This is part of a piece that I'm making throughout my trip that's a portrait of Khalil. Every single day, like a job, would write down everything that happened that day. His drawings and visual representations of what we encountered was so much more than a side thing he did. It was what he was doing. On the side, he was traveling around through Mexico, but religiously, he'd be working on his little books. And I remember thinking it was actually kind of weird at the time. Like, most people look at the guy and they're like, well, there's a <laughs> pot-smoking, drug-dealing, <laughs> skateboard bum. But in reality, you know, it's hard to meet someone who's more dedicated and hardworking. It was a great trip because I learned all about yoga and meditation. I also ended up in Palenque, which is where rainforest meets the Mayan ruins, and I had the best mushroom trip of my life. I'm just sitting here on some rocks for hours and hours, enjoying the views. Ah, where no time matters, just the beauty of the moment. The next big trip I made was to Hawaii. So I used up the last of my student loan to buy a ticket and I went there with only $50 in my pocket. I was living in tents in different beautiful spots to survive. I would eat nothing but crackers and jam. I would find little random jobs to do. Got to pick up this young man hitchhiking with his uh, coffers empty and his will to get some food high. So giving him a chance to, to do the ancient ritual of working for survival. Christmas Eve, I went up uh, the Haleakala volcano. It seems like I'm the only one who likes to camp out in the middle of a volcano on Christmas Eve. Hey, that's all right with me, man. I'm all I need. This is just such a beautiful experience. Girl would be nice. I gave no presents, I received no presents, but I woke up on a really sunny Christmas and I just felt so blessed, you know, to be in such a special place full of energy. Merry Christmas! It was a very magical spiritual experience for me. A very solid trip that I always remember was my six months in Asia where I went to seven different countries. And each one of those countries just had so much to see and experience. It's just too much for me to explain it all, but you know, it definitely changed me a lot and hopefully evolved me for the better.
I would get his uh, correspondences, and I'm like, where is he now? And he's impressing me, right? Because he's a young guy, and I'm some old guy that's never, that never left his neighborhood. And uh, I'm like, he's going all over the place. And I'm thinking, you know, that's a good way for an artist to approach uh, his practice. Not only his art practice, but his life practice. Going to another country, you see how people live in a different setting and a different economic system than you, a different social aspect than you, and you're forced out into these paths that you wouldn't normally enter, right? And relating back to painting, it's all the stories and all your experiences. If you don't have any experiences or stories, what are you painting? For me, the most important thing is to go out and to gain new experiences, to learn. Because you can buy all the things in the world and it could all burn in one day and then you, you got nothing. But a trip, no one can take that away from you. Once you've done your trip, you know, the food is eaten, the experiences will always be in your chest forever, no matter what happens. All this traveling got me back into loving nature and made me be more active about defending it. I can't take it anymore. This has come up once before. Bless land that stays its hand from setting off another wall. So let it be. If the question's never asked, should we stop or let it pass? For the cows that eat the grass are the ones who finish last. My time is quickly leaving me. I've been dead these days. It's been on my mind since therefore I was born. Then there's all that scramble for. We'll survive the coming storm. Will we come out of it? Well, I found it's still a little warm. If I can get all that I want at the push of a button, then... Well, an activist is someone who, through their actions, wants to see a certain type of reality unfold. You're painting a canvas every time that you do any action. Ecological sciences is that anything that happens within a system has its reaction. And so everything that we do, every little action that we carry out, activates something else. And so. Everyone's an activist. We can't all be doing the same thing. We can't all be working for clean water. We can't all be working for children's rights. Everybody has a little something to do, and hopefully that becomes a, a, a woven quilt, something, a large tapestry that we all participate in. I was totally determined to awaken the population of my school. I started writing articles for the school newspaper with different conscious topics. I also spread those same themes in my own radio show that I call The Troop Show. It was a mix between conscious lyric songs and discussions about topics of importance at the time. One of the clubs that contributed to the student life at Dawson was, was Green Earth, and it's sort of an environmental advocacy student group. So Chris and I worked there, and teachers had us in to talk to their classes about what environmental activism is and why one might want to get involved in it. I think Chris brought a total, diff, totally different dimension to things in talking about the sort of the deep spiritual aspects of, of, environmental, um, of environmental matters. What's the purpose of humanity? Uh, are we really just here to fight each other for the bountiful resources in this world? Have wars and struggle and keep some people really rich and others really poor. Is that really what humanity is about? Or are we in this together to rise together and get to the next evolution? If you want to search for that thing that transcends the body, you can find it all inside. All the answers are inside. Yeah, I'm the only one who can free me. Shut up our society. The time is now for us to be everything that we talk about and read. If I can get all that I want at the Shove a button and bring me more buttons. I feel we're on a positive evolution. What we have to do is touch the younger folks so that they grow up in a different paradigm, a different worldview, a different way of perceiving and behaving so that the world changes. It's all for one purpose, so that we get the point of existing here on this beautiful green planet. We can't just assume that we can just take as much as we want. No, it's finite and the cost could be our very existence if we're not smart. 
you know, this whole huge movement has activists on the ground, it has people in the Green Party working to fill the political void, and absolutely essential in all this are the artists who give inspiration and joy and help reach out in the communication. Chris's art is reflective of a spiritual richness. It's like tapping into the dream, but more so, it's like tapping into the evolution of the human spirit. Where are we going? What are the issues as people living in this time that, that we're facing? I feel, um, you know, Chris's art has his you know, thumb right on the pulse of that. The artist is artist. The artist is teacher, student, activist, the whole deal. It doesn't end at art. You're making art is not just about the painting. It's showing that we can manifest our dreams continuously. The artist is not gonna just draw something and she's gonna look at it and she's gonna draw the same thing a thousand times. She's gonna realize that she's growing each time that she's doing it. She might even investigate how she's growing and maybe she'll be able to translate that and tell people and show people. Um, people will be able to observe her growth and say, oh, that's what you're growing. You're actually growing as a person. Not your bank account is growing. You're actually growing as a person. Uh, these are some of the things that I think artists have to offer. Well, it's often called an urban blight, but today graffiti was getting a whole new respect. Our arts reporter Anna Asmakopoulos explains. Chris Dyer has 12 hours to change the face of this stretch of Saint Laurent between René Lévesque and St. Catherine Streets. I'm painting a face of God. Because God is everything and everywhere and, you know, this is one of its faces, you know? And I find these buildings need a lot of healing. about graffiti is that it's an outlet and more so it's a reaction and a kind of voice for people that want to show that there's something not right in the way that the current status quo is working right now so they want to try to project their own imprint on the the face of a city I find that even though graffiti is an illegal activity for obvious reasons, it has big potential to beautify our urban landscapes. It's a chance for us to take control over our cities and, you know, just put art everywhere. Art is there to make people happy, so we don't have to get paid for it all the time. funded then it's an ad it's okay to put whatever you fuck you want anywhere but if it's just a person who wants to put his own art and his own opinion individuality which doesn't exist in the city um, then it's not good anymore so I think it's it's totally turns it on its head and I think it's totally great that people will sacrifice being arrested chased beaten up you know whatever to do art Hello Miami! Si! Sí. No! Okay, más tarde. Ciao! I'm so damn important. So once I finished college, it was time for me to practice the ethical life I had preached so much. So I had to start doing a career out of my art. Art can be a very challenging career to make a lot of money from, or even a little bit of money from. That's why uh, parents rarely tell their kids, hey, go and be an artist, you'll be a millionaire. <laughs> but, uh, you know, when you have to be it, you gotta be it. It's just the way you were born. So the artist, unfortunately, can't just sit at home and perfect their craft. The artist also has to know how to talk to people. The artist has to know how to go out there into the world and share what they're doing. 
which is a great opportunity because the artist is also somebody that, because they're a creative, imaginative people, they can figure out creative and imaginative ways to approach the issues of earning money as an artist. So the first few months of my career, I was super afraid and basically just looking for clients to do jobs for. And I would just have to promote myself a lot in any way I could. I made my first flyers and business cards and I made some stickers on my office computer, promoted this ghetto webpage I had done that eventually through the years got better. Galleries won't just give new artists straight out of school a show, so I had to find other alternative venues to show my art. In a vegan restaurant, in a big popular bar, and that started getting the word around about what I was doing. Another thing I did to promote my art in a more international way was to send CDs with my artwork to all these magazines I was into they started publishing my art, which was super great because through that I started getting real jobs. I was super stoked with my first job, which was uh, for a hemp festival in Holland. They paid me for using my art, which I was like, oh my god, do people actually do that? You know, just send them the JPEGs and they give me money and apparently they do. So I started doing that and haven't stopped since. My clients find me through the internet most times or through magazine articles and then they come to me and they buy a piece and we talk about the piece and we talk about other things, philosophize and uh, many times I actually become friends with them. Beautiful! Yeah! Another one for the collection. Take a look at that. One of my favorite things about uh, Chris's paintings, the majority of them have fluorescent paint which shows up only under black light, so it's really like having two different paintings. Chris is an amazing individual. Chris has uh, inspired myself and through myself being inspired, um, my little brother here has also been inspired to start creating his own art. That just goes to show how beautiful of a person Chris is, that his art can inspire people through you know, exponential levels. And that's absolutely incredible. That's the mark of a true shaman. I could spend like weeks to months on a piece sometimes and it's tough to let it go but at the same time it's my job and I I gotta learn to listen up in permanence and just let my children go and do their thing around the world and hopefully pay some bills too, you know? Making products from your art is very helpful too because it makes it more accessible for uh, normal people to buy it, not just the people with lots of money. So for the last six years, I've been doing my own clothing brand which uses a lot of my art, but also I've chosen to use sustainable materials like hemp and organic cotton to, you know, make it more environmentally friendly and at the same time hire local workers. I want to make sure that if I work with other people that we're not hurting the planet, we're not hurting the people, that's important. Another product that's come into manifestation with the help of a MySpace friend is the Sunlight Chronicles. It's a different kind of expression, black and white ink drawings and writings of daily life events and thoughts. And they're out there published and it's another way for me to get money rolling back in without having to charge more than 10 bucks. It's little things that artists have to do in order to make a living, you know?
Another art job I've got in is uh, teaching art art workshops at uh, high schools and colleges over the years. I've also gotten the chance to teach a skateboard art workshop at the National Art Gallery in Canada. I get to make art with a bunch of kids and that's a super blessing for me. I started putting art on skateboards back in the late 90s when all I could afford were skate shop blanks. I'm really not a great skateboarder so I broke a lot of boards and, and these were my friends. I just put them thrown in the garbage. We had adventures together. I just can't treat it as is. It's just garbage. So I kept them and as an artist it was just natural that eventually I would start making art on it. Never knew what did ya? Something bright inside, then you feel it all over. Feeling like I just found a four leaf clover. Almighty God, but you know for your shoulder. Living in the youth, I can never grow older. Living in the skateboarding is a meditation. And when you're riding a board, you're focusing on a lot of your energy into that board and there's so much captured in that little piece of wood that by painting it, all that energy floats up into the image naturally. It's quite good for me, but at the same time, I help that dead tree have everlasting life. It makes me quite happy that the tree, which is the basis of life on this planet, gets to be honored in that way. Paint it, it gives it, it, it gives this wood life again so you can remember a bit of life, a bit of light, a bit of art. One, I landed my dream job of doing skateboard graphics for a big company in San Francisco called Creation Skateboards, also known as the Tory Movement. You influence one person's life to make like a positive change, then you've impacted the world. A lot of the distribution and brands out there are like just trying to sell cheap product and make money and it's all about the bottom line so we're for us more about trying to do skateboarding sustainably, keep it fun but also keep it quality. Chris Dyer's work is just super vibrant, super psychedelic but more spiritual. Well over 30 decks now, Chris definitely just kind of separates creation from the rest. The idea of skating for a small roots kind of brand is to stay away from the whole corporate skate world right now that, you know, not dissing it, but the idea is that you skate for a homegrown brand, you get a chance to have your ideas given and you get a chance to do a lot of different fun things, traveling and all that, and so you need to be around things like that. It gives you individual growth. skating since I was six year old. Once you start skating and you choose what's gonna be underneath the board because the, the board is the extension of who you are, you know? 
Chris just did one of my graphics. It's full of spontaneity, it's full of creativity, and that's what I classify as art. Dude, everybody's marketable once you speak with your heart, you know? Let's support that, you know what I mean? That's what skateboarding and rootsy brands, who are really rootsy involved, it's about, you know what I mean? It's just like helping the bigger scene to grow. Let's keep the frame alive and put my four wheels on the ground and push as fast as I can. All right, man. Well, thanks for throwing it down. I'm here with Rafik on the wall. It's a start. It's the first one right here. He got it started. It's art, man. I'm digging it. Skateboarding is art. It's free will to each individual practicing and doing it. You push yourself and you challenge yourself and you develop your own style. You can watch five to 10 different people do the same trick and not one of the tricks is gonna look the same, even though they're all doing the same trick. Without self-expression, skateboarding would be nothing and, and that's how we express our thoughts and our ideas. Chris Dyer's art was one of my favorite boards and I love skating on it. It's not just a functional tool, it actually has thought to it, feeling. It's super awesome to see these really talented skateboarders doing crazy tricks on my art. In that way, I feel that my art has really departed my grasp and it's doing its own thing under the feet of other people. I've been making pictures for 20 years and was a pro skateboarder and helped start some skateboard companies and have just been creating art for a long time in one form or another. Chris Dyer's kind of in like a special place. He becomes the skate punk kid in the midst of spirituality or he becomes the spiritual kid in the midst of all these punk rockers that are skaters. He's got this dichotomy in his life and he's expressing that through his art. I feel it's very important to have really nice artwork on board, conscious, positive, because there's so much negativity out there. So much, so many skulls and this and all the rock and roll. I mean, it's, it's good too, but it's not positive. Chris Dyer's art is seriously, it's next level, spiritual artwork. It's up there with Alex Graves. Definitely different styles, but the, the feeling you get from his art is very powerful. I think that there's an ethical responsibility that comes with making art and with sharing it. And that's going to influence young people, then I am in favor of positive imagery. Imagery that transmits a message of a higher possibility for people. A new way of seeing can, uh, you know, catalyze a new way of being for people. On top of that, positive graphics make it easier to sell because then you're not having to kind of come up with the reason for why you have this graphic a certain way. I think we have to realize that our industry is based on a lot of kids, and if we want kids to get inspired and skate and buy products and stick around, we've got to like skew it towards them. Oh, that's a good boy. Look, he's got a Ron Allen. High five. Get it on. A new enthusiast for skateboarding. <laughs> The world of skateboarding seems like it's changed so much from when I got into it, when it was like mid-80s. There was no market behind skateboarding culture. Today, skateboarding is like a multi-billion dollar industry. But I guess everybody's like underground world becomes mainstream as they get older. I was lucky to be in a different moment in time. Now everything's mass produced and pumped out and a lot of the companies 
today are all like kind of chewing on each other's ideas instead of being original in their own. And I always like to collaborate with the artist who does the artwork. It becomes a piece of art and it also becomes original. The Big old is like no other spot. It's like a perfect wave made out of cement that scares the hell out of you, but it's like so addictive that you overcome your fear just to get your fix. And we've skated it for over 20 years. When you've done something long enough, whether it's skateboarding or doing art, you, you become part of that. Some people just live their art and that's what drives them to do it and the point is pretty much essence over hype and if you can get paid doing your art staying true to it then you win double. After all this work that I've done for like a couple years, I finally landed my first gallery show at a Montreal gallery called Seek's Gallery. It's called Metaphysical Boarding. His latest exhibit showcases some of his most popular items. You can check out the visionary art at Zeke's Gallery until October 10th. It was quite successful. I made some sales and I finally got to the next level of my career. Gallery shows are very important because you get to show your art straight to the audience and they get to see the real colors and the real details without the filter of a computer or a picture of a book and that's pretty crucial. By now I've shown all over North America and it's a real blessing to be able to go out there and you know see new lands as I show my work. The perspective of this art show and the artists that we've gathered, um, a lot of people call them visionary. I call it interdimensional. There's like a multiplicity that we're all expressing with our art. And to me that multiplicity is an example of uh, the multiplicity that we are living in at this time. We have different cultures colliding into each other. We have 300 products for one thing. <laughs> we're living a, in a very multi-dimensional reality. Definitely we're looking at the world and, and how the world needs to heal and we are trying to um, create a platform so we can make artists functional because we're living in a world where like artists or visionaries uh, that have these feelings but uh, it doesn't fit in the world in the way it is and that is a very destructive thing. Uh, meanwhile, we are forced to be in fear to try and to fit into a system that is not functional. Visionary art is an expression of the world within and the world beyond this one. To me, it really represents a potentials of our culture and our people and our world for a more harmonic, more sustainable, a more abundant place for everyone to live. It can serve this role that can inspire and affirm everybody's place in the world. It can also form bridges between different cultures, and I feel like that's helping to heal a lot of the divides that we feel maybe separate us from each other, and it kind of shows us that we're not separated at all, that we're all totally connected. The Thai and I consciousness, everything unified, you know? Kind of stumbled up on it myself. But then, like you said, I've drawn that before. Alex Gray has drawn that before. And other, many other people have. But I didn't know that, you know? It's a perfect symbol of that, too. Connected consciousness. So it's like pretty, pretty rad. It's kind of like...
like a, a need for most artists, I think, to express something more than what they normally can see, to inspire imagination. Everything that, everything that we have now in this great, beautiful world is from thought. So with that idea, you know, artists can manifest really beautiful things for their culture and the people that are around them by painting peace and joy and food. You know, as the sun's changing, as our world is shifting, artists can be present you know, for the divine and to express like the current code you know, the right kind of drop, the right way to, you know, the truth at the moment. My first international show was actually in Lima, Peru, the land where I grew up. So it's a like super blessing to learn things in other places and to bring it back. I never really get to make many sales in poor countries like Peru, but I'm not out there to you know, make a profit. I go more passing with positive vibes and showing my work and at the same time traveling around those places, this time with new eyes since I changed so much since the last time I'd be in Peru. The next international show I had was in Cancun, Mexico. These awesome local artists from there invited me to their studio. We made art for a couple months and then we showed it at a gallery. presentarles un poco de, del espacio que, que compartimos con Chris Dyer, que pudimos tener la maravillosa experiencia de tenerlo aquí. Aquí se la pasaba día y noche, siempre pintando y pintando. La verdad es que nunca quería salir, siempre que queríamos ir a... lo invitábamos a alguna reunión, a una fiesta, era... No, no, no prefiero pintar, prefiero pintar. Y bueno, así es. somos. Esta es la pantera rosa, aquí Cris se la pasaba horas y horas y horas pintando, solamente quería hacer eso, ya que su trabajo lleva pues, sí, demasiado detalle. Positive Creations. Siento que nuestro arte se, se complementa por eso, ¿no? por los colores, la, la forma de, de las figuras, de los, los elementos, la simbología nos une esa espiritualidad que queremos mostrar. During that Mexico exhibition, I actually got to meet this girl on the computer on MySpace who lived in Belgium. She got me my next show and I went later that year. I got him into two galleries. One of the galleries was a comic book gallery and the other one was a graffiti art gallery. But they were both very much into colorful art, which is important. For instance, art is very colorful. This inner child is very present, so that makes him a spiritual artist on the one side, and on the other side, he's not too serious, because artists that are too serious can never really capture the real image of consciousness, you know, like the true master is humorous and happy. I think his art is very honest. He is very honest about his own feelings and his own stories in life. So he would picture himself the way he feels at a certain moment in his life and show this to the people and say 
if you feel like this or that, it's very normal. We're human beings. So spiritual evolution is also about accepting who you are and accepting all the aspects of being a human being and not like torturing yourself, being like, ooh, I gotta be like this or that. No, just accept it and enjoy it, whatever it will be. So after Chris visited Belgium, I visited him in Montreal to do a collaboration painting together of Queen Menon and Hail Selassie at first. We complemented each other very well and it's our creation baby. It shows that although we are different and we've got different styles, we both have something in common to show the world brightness. So eventually I fell in love with her and uh, she came to live with me in, in Montreal and by now she is my wife. I love you Bao. Come, <laughs> join me. This is my wife. <laughs>
quite like the amazing experience because it's a city made out of art done by so many creative souls, around 50,000 people who get together. It's all about creating whatever. There's no rules. You know, as long as you have respect for the land and for the people, you can create anything you want. Burning Man is a utopian art gathering. I say it's utopian because everybody's reliant on their own uh, sort of creative wisdom. People vision outrageous, amazing things and then they bring them into existence and share them with other really creative people. So it's a way that creativity is serving the evolution of consciousness. If we decide to seek the truth, what would be tomorrow's outcome? We have the capacity to imagine a better reality and manifest it through images. And as long as you're aligned with your higher purpose, things can go wrong. I'm just doing some signs for the Pantheon Genesis Temple. That will be my contribution, as well as some uh, canvas prints and some decorations for the altar. Pantheon Genesis Temple is a project being built at Burning Man. It is a 10,000 square foot sacred uh, complex of uh, six temples around a central labyrinth. It's all about how does geometry underlie structure. In a nutshell, this is a dynamic and flowing sort of multi-dimensional portal into creation. The general theme and purpose of the temple is really to heal the world. A growing eco-consciousness is happening here at Burning Man as well, even though it's a, you know, <laughs> over-the-top carbon emissions here. There's something about sacrifice, and uh, they burn a lot of wood here, so, you know, we're sacrificing the plant kingdom. but puts you in touch with your own impermanence and the importance of getting something done uh, as soon as possible. Did I mention that everything at Burning Man ends up burning in the end? Check this out. Society has been completely irresponsible in terms of ecology. We're destroying life processes. We're ignoring the way interactions function. Everything is linked. Chris's art shows us so clearly the, the energetic linkages and the, you know everything, how everything's interconnected. It's not just a spiritual trippy thing, it's actual reality. Ecological responsibility individually and collectively is the way we got to go to shift away from our own extinction. can't save everybody, that's for sure. You gotta save yourself first and foremost, and then share those those like survival skills with other good spirits that you feel can understand. We're full of so much energy, but we only have so much faith in ourselves because we've been so desensitized from young to up. The lucky ones that aren't too desensitized and can still think for themselves, those are the ones that can actually change the world.
the lay people, we have the most power. You know, all these powerful people with money, they rely on us to, to buy their products to keep them rich. So the power lies with the people. If we stay positive and work together, we can, we can have a, re a revolution. We as artists have a major power in which we can influence the world to change. Everything as humans comes from a, an art perspective so we can see. And this is a power that we have to claim back as visionary artists to promote conscious change. So really if we all have an obligation to ourselves to pick up our true identities. Art is a perfect means for this, but one has to always pay attention to one's motives and intentions. And it's through this that we learn about ourselves and others. It's how we expand the dimensions of our soul and learn about things that we can't learn in school. <laughs> The artist has the ability to show his dreams and the other dimensions that he sees to people who are, don't have the ability to see it, so that they can also start the process of seeing more than just the three-dimensional world. And that's the part that's so healing for human beings, because how can you ever evolve if you can't see further than the world surrounding you? You need to jump up and see the world behind it because there's so many layers to see and the artist shows these layers even when the artist shows the dark sides of humanity that's also good because that means that those darker dimensions are being healed at the same time and people can face their insecurities instead of always putting them back because I think everything should be conscious and everything should be put into light really good art even if it's made for an advertisement it can be inspiring you know things can like touch you in some way and if that artist or creative mind has touched you then that inspires you that there's a connectivity between everybody and there's like a web of consciousness and just for that moment you're you can be connected then that's what art is supposed to do wisdom come to bring a higher vibration solid foundation real elevation pure intention through ancient meditation if you really want to see your soul start to shine feed your mind with something divine through your thoughts words and your actions you will feel pure satisfaction could you imagine a world without art that would be like go to work go home masturbate sleep eat not in go to work you know like uh, It'd be the worst place, there'd be nothing, no personal expression, no freedom of thought. Only in art can you see like something you've never seen before ever that's not explained and it's like an individual. The art is the last frontier. Now you're high up in the sky. I believe we're at a very uh, crucial part in human history. It's important for us to start thinking what we want in our lives and, and in the world. You gotta start to bring forth that beauty that's there already. Be a good role model to the people in your community and even just your friends and your families and that way you're already making an impact in the world and we keep on expanding like these little satellites of positivity. Eventually, the vibration of the world will get higher and we will make things better. I do believe it's possible and I'm working at it in my small contribution and I'll hope you too. And Yeah, thanks so much for joining me and my friends in this little adventure through creativity. Enjoy everything. Peace. Well, together, you know, we will stand stronger. Unified, you know, we will live longer. Lessons be straighten up the angle. But no self destruct, I know it's hard to handle. Star crystal matrix cast lines over me. Aligned is my vibration with the Almighty. The stars will be born and die. In the time that it takes to blink the Almighty. This one goes.
goes out to my children, my family, and all my friends, to the world, to creation, yo. Blessed love, blessed is creation, blessed is the most high unto every nation, blessed is every color, we must be patient, we are just patience in this place where we use as a station. Blessed love, blessed is creation, blessed is the most high unto every nation, blessed is every color, we must be patient, we are just patience in this place where we use as a station. Get my mocha chai out here, pronto. Hey, what's up, buddy? Hey, Karen. Muchas gracias. Yeah, man, just on Chris Dyer, positive creations, more love, more life, and more prosperity. Bless! Chris Dyer to me is an inspiration. I am not joking. My life would be a lot more pathetic without Chris's influence. And uh, I'll leave it at that. Fuck you! I'm going to the door. He came out into the living room with these awful dreadlocks. And I said, you can't go out on the street looking like that. And he said, why not? And there was, that was one night we had an argument. And I called his parents in Lima, and they made him undo his dreadlocks. Terrible. <laughs> Manifest the lessons, celestial connections, peer pressure bring questions, that's answered by the blessings. Back against the wall, haters hoping you fall, trying to shit where I eat, first we're choking them all. But I rose above the madness, acquired knowledge of self, shook the ways of a savage, now I'm flying like a stealth. Some said I couldn't do it, now I'm raps Michael Phelps, in the image of God, repeating the cycle with finesse. It's the little things yep. that paints a bigger picture. Uh -huh. I seen the world and I'm from Queens and that's considered wishing. I touch millions through my words of pain. Now the millions turn my pain into herbs and grain. Weather some severe storms, escape sticky bushes. Got a lot of nice things, your pole keeps a pushing. Thankful for it all. Where's my woman? Letting uh. the born Prince Poe to MC. Blessed love, blessed is creation. Blessed is the most high unto every nation. Blessed is every color, we must be patient. We are just patience in this place of where we use as a station. Blessed love, blessed is creation. Blessed is the most high unto every nation. Blessed is every color, we must be patient. We are just patience in this place of where we use as a station.